I invite you to open with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 16, with a uh, special Father's Day message today, which I entitled Steel and Velvet. 1 Corinthians, chapter 16, and we're just going to look at two verses this morning, uh, verse 13 and 14. And brothers, what, I, what I'm going to say to you this morning, I say to myself, and I say it in love. Um, some, sermon, some of these sermons have an edge to it. This sermon has an edge to it. Uh, but I say it in love, and I say it to myself as well. So I pray that the Lord speak to us through this as, as men. And ladies, um, you say this doesn't apply to me today. It does apply to you. You can take something from it. Uh, one thing that you can take from it is take these things that we're going to talk about and learn and pray these into your husband's life. So let's uh, stand to honor the word of God this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. Let's read that together as a congregation. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word once again this morning. We thank you for the praises of your people. And Father, we know that your word is said to be a double-edged sword. And Father, I pray that it would pierce our hearts today, but it would also heal our hearts today. We pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us, would anoint us, and help us to apply these things into our life. Help us to see our Savior, and help us to see ourselves in the mirror of your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So on Father's Day, as we think about our dads, as we think about the men in our lives that had influence on us, let me just throw out a few words to you, some descriptions that maybe you can relate with. Macho, sensitive, wild, caring, best buddy, one who stands alone. One who inspires another, one who bonds, one who innovates, one who takes risks. Which of those descriptions are you? What defines you as a man? What de defines your partner in marriage? What defines your father, your brother, or your friend? Because in today's America, much has changed about men. And you say, what? what has changed about men today? We don't even know what men are today, friends. And you say, what, what has happened here? It all goes back to the book of Genesis chapter 3. The same thing that's going on with the authority of the Word of God is going on in men and women's lives today. And here it is. It's very simple. It's very true. Did God really say that? And, oh, no. Not only did he say that, did he really mean that? Because he really couldn't have meant Ephesians chapter 5. He couldn't mean 1 Peter chapter 3. No, he doesn't mean those things. Oh, no, no, no. Let, let the culture define what a man is. No, no. God said it. I believe it. It is what it is. And actually, friends, it doesn't even matter if I believe it. God said it, and it's there. Friends, there's a book out there, a good book. A man by the name of David Blackenhorn. He wrote a book called The Fatherless America. And he said this, quote, Men in general, and fathers in particular, are increasingly viewed as superfluous to family life, either expendable or as part of the problem. Masculinity masculinity itself understood as anything other than a rejection of what it has traditionally meant 
to be a male is typically treated with suspicion and hostility in our cultural discourse. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Men, they're saying you're not necessary, and actually you're part of the problem. That's what that's saying. Fatherless American men, you're part of the problem. We don't even really need you at this point. But that could be much further from the truth that we see in God's Word. And we see what we see happening in our country, what we see happening in our churches, is the decay of what it means to be a man of God. But that brings us to that magic question this morning, right? What is a man? What does it mean to be a man? Because let's be honest, it's sort of confusing out there, right? Because back decades ago, what a man was was this. You know, he's protective. He's the provider. You know, he's the, he's the, go, the go-to guy. He doesn't show his emotion. He doesn't cry. You know, he ha- doesn't really have that sensitive bone in his body. He's that real hard guy, you know. Sort of many of us probably grew up under that realm. And then later in the 90s, what happens? We're told, oh, no, 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 guys. Here, here's what you need to be now. You need to show your emotion. You need to be f- more family-oriented. You need to be more sensitive. You need to be in touch with your emotions, guys. And now we come into 2022, and the truth is, we don't even know what a biological man even is today. Because, friends, the culture is suffering from an identity crisis that's never been seen. And why? We, don't even, we can't even define man and woman anymore. With all, that th- with, all th- with all that said, friends, where do we turn? We turn to the Word of God for a definition. And here in these two verses, there is a definition of a biblical man. Whether you're more like Esau, who's that rugged man of the woods, the hunting, the fishing, that type of guy, or you're more of a Jacob, more of a, a homebody type guy, these verses apply to all of us gentlemen this morning. And he tells us, how a man is to think, how he's to look, how he's to act, and you can summarize it in two words, and I did it in the title, steel and velvet. Steel and velvet, because Paul gives us right here in these two verses five imperatives, five definitions of what a biblical man looks like, and this ranges from decade to decade, from generation to generation. It is an everlasting definition of what a man is. So where does this, before we get into this, what's the context of this? 1 Corinthians is a letter not of doctrinal instruction, but it's a letter of correction. Paul is correcting all kinds of false ideas, all kinds of nonsense that's going on in the the Corinthian church, all this carnal behavior. He says, basically, he's whooping their butt and saying, you guys, you need to grow, grow up. Grow up in the faith. Stop acting like this. And he says, 14 chapters, 15 chapters of correction on theology and spiritual gifts and all these things. But then he comes to verse 16 in the last chapter and he says, Friends, brothers and sisters in Corinth, I say these things to you and I say these things to you men in in particular in love. Because why? This is why, friends, brothers and sisters, listen carefully. Because... Gentlemen and ladies, in the day that we are living, when you stand against the feminist movement, when you stand against the LGBTQT movement, when you stand against the ease of millennials, when you have to fight the own laziness of your own flesh, the cravings even of your wives and your children to take the head and to lead the home and to be less than what God has called you to be. Friends, you're going to need to stand, but you're going to need a lot of love. Because you know what we see in our nation today, friends? We see the degradation, the collapse of a culture. Why? Because we want to blame the White House. We want to blame the political parties of the day. But here's the truth of the matter, friends. The truth is, it's because men are not being men anymore. Some pastor said it, and it cuts me like a knife. He says, the world is the way it is, is because I am the way that I am. And that's the truth, friends. We need to stop blaming everybody else and start doing what we need to be doing 
as men. Friends, this verse right here, I'll read it again. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, let all that you do be done with love. Gentlemen, what does a man look like in the scripture? Number one, a man accepts the responsibility to lead. Number one, he accepts the responsibility to lead. Here's the word. Watch, watch, watch. What does that mean? It means be on guard, be alert. Don't drift off to la-la land. Because, friend, do you know, gentlemen, you have an enemy? You have an enemy. He's prowling around like a roaring lion, the Bible says. And if I told you tonight, someone's coming to your house. He's going to ravage your kids. He's going to ravish your wife. Could you sleep? No. You couldn't sleep. You'd be drinking coffee. You'd be ready, wouldn't you? But that's the very thing that is happening today, friends. There is an enemy doing those exact things. And we're sleeping. We're not awake. We need to wake up. Friends, if you know there's an enemy coming against everything in your world, can we not watch and be on guard? Friends, stay awake. We can't be indifferent to these things. It's easy today in our culture with all these activities, all these things we can get our hands involved in to become indifferent to the spiritual realm, to become indifferent to prayer, indifferent to Bible study, indifferent to worship, and we can find ourselves straddling all these different things, and guess what's happening? The enemy is putting you to sleep, and he's sowing seeds. And his goal is to destroy Seek, kill, and destroy. And he wants to, and he is. And friends, we as men, we are called to be the watchmen on the wall. What comes in the home, what comes out of the home, what are you allowing? Paul says, men, you're to watch. Friends, too many men today want to spend more time on their toys, more time on their work than in the spiritual arena. Friends, is your wife teaching you the Word of God? Is she quoting Scripture to you? Are you teaching her the Word of God? Are you washing her by the water of the Word, as the Bible says? Because, friends, Jesus tells a very, very alarming parable in Matthew 13. It's the wheat and the tares. And evidently it's wheat season, right? So the wheat and the tares, two things that are growing up right alongside one another, okay? Okay. Here's the thing. When they're young, they look exactly the same. They're like a type of darnel grass. They look exactly the same. You can't tell the difference. What's he saying? He's saying you can look at a congregation of Christianity as a whole. Oh, yeah, they talk Christian. They look Christian. They, they come to church even as a Christian. But you know what? As they mature, as they grow up, then it becomes evident. Oh, that's a wheat. That's a tear. The tear is going to be cast out into the fire. But the most alarming part of that passage to me personally is this. He said, what happened in that farm? An enemy came in and sowed a seed. And it's happened, it says, very particularly, while men slept. While men slept, an enemy came in and started to sow these things. Sow your things in your family. He sows the things in the church. He shows, sows the things in your home. All those different aspects while men slept. The funny thing is, the funny thing about sleeping, right? You don't even know you're sleeping. When you're sleeping, you don't know you're sleeping. Friends, we are called to watch. You say, Pastor, what am I watching for? You're saying watch, but what do, what do I need to be looking at? What do I need to be looking at? Four negatives, one positive. I'll give them to you quickly. Four negatives. Number one, you're watched for the enemy himself, Satan. 1 Peter chapter 5. Two, you're to watch for temptation. Temptation is always at the door. He talks to Cain, right? Remember in Genesis, Cain? He says, Cain, sin is crouching at the door. Sin is crouching at the door. Friend, temptation is right over your shoulder. It's only one step away from you falling into something crazy. Don't think you won't. 
Because you're, you can. As soon as you think you won't, you will. Satan, temptation. Thirdly, indifference. Just total indifference. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, right? Laodicea, you're not hot, nor you're not cold. You're just, uh, whatever, whatever happens, you know, this is... I read my Bible every now and then. I, I'll pray every when I get to it. I'll come to worship. That's last on the agenda, though. It's indifference, whatever. What about false teachers? Number four. Those people who teach what is wrong, rightfully wrong. I'm not saying those things where we we uh, sort of can debate about like end times and the days of Genesis. We can sort of debate on those type of things, but I'm talking just blunt wrong. And you see the Methodist church today, and I'm not picking on them, but schism. Why? False teachers came in. People aren't watching. That's just the truth. People aren't watching. Positive, two positives. We are to be watching in prayer. The Bible says Ephesians chapter 6. Are you watching in prayer this morning? Are you watching in prayer? We have a prayer meeting. We have a prayer meeting here every Wednesday morning, 6.30. People are busy, I understand. You watching in prayer? I hope you are. Lord's return. We're supposed to be watching. Do you aware that Jesus Christ is going to come back one day? And that could be today. The Bible says, watch. Gentlemen, what does this look like? You ever watch those guys at the Buckingham Palace? Man, decked out. Lay, I mean, these men are lasered in. You look at their eyeballs, and they are lasered. You understand this about them. Nothing's getting by them. Nothing. Not, they got things under wrap. It's under control. This is what Paul's talking about. Are we awake? Are we watching? Are we accepting the call and the responsibility of leading in prayer, in leading in devotion, in meeting our wife's needs. And that's not just a physical thing, my friends. That's not bringing us home a paycheck. That's emotional. That's spiritual. You say, ah, oh, you know what? That's a counselor's job. No, no, no. You know, that's a pastor's. No, 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 gentlemen. That's your job. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And God wouldn't call us to do something that he wouldn't equip us to do, friends. He's get, he'll give us the strength to do those things. How about church? Are you leading in church? What do you mean? Well, here, listen carefully. If, and again, gentlemen and ladies, you know I am graced out. I'm all about grace. I need grace. And I'm not legalistic and I'm not, you know, you have to do A, B, C, and D. Listen to this, though. If you bail on worship, if you bail on church for something optional. I'm not saying, you know, my job's saying I got to come to work or I'm fired, you know what I mean? Like, that's just how it is. I'm not saying things like that. You got games that you want to play. You got sports that you want to engage in. You got guns that you want to shoot off. And you want to just put worship back in the back burner? Listen carefully. Your children will go even further than that. You are setting an example for the next generation. And guess what? You can come to church. You can raise your hands, holy hands in prayer. But when they see that in your life, they know what is really important in your life. And they can see through it like a wet piece of paper, my friends. Amen. And they will know what is important to mom. They will know what is important to dad. Friends, we need to be watching in the days that we are living we got to watch, guys. Number two. Number two. A man pleases God and not man. Pleases God and not man. This is where Paul says, too, stand fast in the faith. Stand fast in the faith. Again, what's the context? False teachers of the day. We have them today, too, friends. We have a lot of false ideologies out there today. And that's why Jude tells us, he says, I want you to contend earnestly for the faith. Those words contend, it, merely, it literally means put your boxing gloves on, put your boxing gloves on and get in the ring and start fighting for the faith. Friends, we are losing ground as Christians. We are losing ground as Americans because we are not contending for the faith. We're just throwing up the white flag almost and saying, oh, just let it, let it flow, man. Just let it flow. Listen. 
He says, look, you need to live to please God. And don't worry about what men say. We got to be like those three boys in Daniel chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember the day? You remember the count. You either bow or you burn. That's it. That's it. You bow or you're going to burn. And today, friends, we have to say this. I am not going to bow to your gender bender ideology. I'm not going to bend to the idea that all roads lead to heaven. I'm not going to bend to this idea of, you know, everything, just love everybody. Everything's going to be okay. Just, you know, all the religions are, are just the same. Because, friends, you're, the culture today is attempting to break the mold of Christian men and to reshape them into what they want. Paul said, don't allow that to happen. You need to be reshaped and conformed to the Word of God by the transforming, by the renewing of your mind. See, friends, today in our culture, here's sort of the issue today. Men, you can have your religion. You can have your Bible. You can even talk about Jesus occasionally. That's okay. That's fine. You, you got your church. You do that in your church. But, but, as long as you bow down to the other things, though, too. You can have Jesus, but you must bow down also to this other thing. You know what that is? That's what they call pluralism. And that's what you can read about in the Old Testament. 1 Kings chapter 13. A man by the name of Jeroboam. He made two golden calves. Not the golden calf of Exodus. Two golden calves he sets up in Dan and Bethel. And he tells the people of Israel, Ah! Oh, you can worship here, Jehovah God, with this golden calf. Pluralism. You can wor worship God, but you can, you can also worship here at this altar. No, we can only worship at one altar, my friends. Man, this is why we have to be in the Word of God. This is why we have to be in prayer. Because listen, how are we ever, ever, ever going to stand if we don't even know what we're standing for? You're not going to stand if you don't even know what you're standing for. You know that old country song that says, you got to stand for something or you're going to fall for anything. And today, my friends, too many guys are falling. We're falling because we don't even know. Why? Because we know more about fantasy football statistics than the Word of God. We know more about engines than the Word of God. We know more about stocks and portfolios than the Word of God. Friends, if we replaced all the knowledge, all that stuff that we have with the Word of God, we would be standing strong today. Friend, we as men need to be standing, not as dead posts in the ground, but as trees planted by rivers of living water. A man of God, listen carefully, depends on God's Word for every decision, for every direction, for every discussion, despite what the world thinks. He fears God over everything. You say, you know, are you afraid? You know, too many guys say, you know what? I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Really? Are you, re are you afraid? You might be afraid to stand. What do you mean? What about when your wives... Start gossiping. Do you shut it down? You shut it down? Why, what are you doing? Why are you slaying the pastor? Why are you slaying your brother and sister? You just sat next to him in church. Don't, no, no. No. How about afraid to tell your children to come to church? How about afraid to maybe share your faith with somebody? Friends, we need in this day to fear God. Don't say, no, it's mom's job. It's not mom's job. It's our job to take the lead in these areas and be who God has called us to be. Gentlemen, let me challenge you this morning. Listen carefully. What crown, what crown are you living for? What do you mean? Are you living for the temporary crown of this life? Are you are you? living for the eternal crown of heaven. Is everything that you do and you pursue and you think about have to do with this now? 
Because the Bible talks about crowns. And that's one thing you can take into eternity, friends, gentlemen. And don't you want to get to heaven? Don't you want to go to heaven and have a crown? Not to sport, but to, the Bible says you're going to cast it down at the feet of Jesus and say, worthy is the Lamb. And friends, the crown, it says, never, ever fades away. The crowns of this day will fade away. What are we living for? Man, guys, this is our goal in life. This is the goal for every man, every woman in the sanctuary this morning to hear our Savior, our Lord, our Jesus say these words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come in. Don't you want to hear those words? I do. Men, we are called to initiate and lead responsibly. We are called to fear God, not man. Number three, a man rejects passivity. He rejects passivity to follow God's word. This is said here, and it says, be brave. Some of your translations, I don't like the idea it says, be brave. The older translations say, <clears throat> act like men. I like the King James. It says, quit you like men. Quit you like men. I like that. Quit you like men. It's really a call to maturity. The Greek word there is andrizeveth, drizeveth. And the idea there is there's no feminine equivalent. There's not, no feminine equivalent to that. Why? Because men, we're called to be courageous. We're, we're not called to be you know, faint, you know, timid like children or faint-hearted like, like some, some women. Friend, God designed the genders to be different. They're different. Some are masculine, some are feminine. And by the way, the culture says that's bad, but what does God say? Is he said, actually, it's very good. And I take God's word over the culture's word. He said, those traits are good. Friends, we have to stop trying to avoid confrontation. We have to start speaking up. And you say, I speak up. I see this all the time in the marriage context, and it goes like this. I, uh, she makes all the plans. She makes all the decisions. And wh you know why that is? Do you know why that is? Because we really don't want any confrontation. That's what it really is all about. I just, whatever, whatever, whatever. What no, 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 no. Come on, man. It's like, what are you doing? You are called to lead. I'm not saying a domineering type thing because I hear this all the time. You know, if mama's happy, then everything is good. Listen, if God's happy, mama's going to be happy and everything's going to be good. That's, that's, that's where it needs to be, friend. I want to make God happy. If God's happy, mom's going to be happy. The children are going to be happy. And that's the bottom line. Friends, this is our calling. And you say, how do I mature? How do I grow into this? Because honestly, we're all a work in progress, right? He says, crave the newborn. Like newborn babies crave milk. Crave the word of God. Crave, what are you eating today? I'm not talking about lunch. I'm talking about what are you feeding your spirit this morning? Are you eating milk? Are you eating meat? Because wouldn't it be weird if tomorrow you went down to Batson's and you were in Batson's tomorrow and you walked in, you saw a grown man, I mean, big guy, bearded out, you know, jacked. He's drinking a bottle. That'd be so creepy, right? It'd be, it'd be like, yeah, people are laughing, right? But that's exactly what many people are doing with the Word of God. Grown men still drinking the milk of the Word. Friend, if you have been coming to a church for 15, 20 years, you should be well equipped to be able to teach the Word of God. Friends, this is our calling. We are called to know the truth. We are called to live the truth. We are called to set the example of the truth. And by the way, friends, gentlemen, I always tell gentlemen this, we are called as leaders, it comes with responsibility. We apologize first in the argument. You come to marriage, you come to, to premarital counseling, that's one thing that you learn. Number one of these things, 
I don't care if she's totally 100% right. She may be 100% right, and you're fighting. She may have, you know, you, you have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You know what? As a leader of the home, you go and you start the reconciliation process. That is our role. Because, friends, the Bible speaks. Amos speaks to this. Amos speaks to this. Amos chapter 4, verse 11. I like Amos. Amos is my favorite prophet. Amos liked figs. I like figs. Amos is very blunt. He just tells it how it is. He says, listen. He said, "There's a, the culture of the day, what was happening? The men were just being just led around astray. And he said, the wives of the day, and I'm not even going to use the term. He uses a derogatory, a derogatory term to describe them. And he says, the wives of the day tell the men, bring me the drinks. Bring me the wine. He says, listen, gentlemen. He said, what's going to happen is the enemy's going to come in. He's going to put a hook through your nose, and they're going to draw you away captive. That's what's going to happen because you're not fulfilling your God-given role as a man. Friends, men, it's time to put away the childish things. It's time to grow up in the faith. It's time to start pursuing Christ actively, actively. Fourthly, we're to lead responsibly. We're to fear God, not man. We're not to be passive, but we are to be active. Fourthly, we are called to, to lead courageously. There's two words there. And I think these next couple things are the most important, friends. Not, not to say one's not more important. Two words. Be strong. Be strong. What's he say? He say, go, go lift some weights? No, no, no. He says, be strong. Because honestly, what, I'm, what, what, what are we doing here? This is a man-sized task, is it not? This is huge, right? This is like, whoa, you, what are you telling me to do? Yeah, right. I can't do it. No, I can't do it either. That's why he says these words right here. Be strong. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives because this word here, it's not a one and done. The tense, it literally means this. Continue to be strengthened. It's a continual strengthening. And how do we get the continuing strengthening in our lives, friends? What does the Bible say? Zechariah 4, 6. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. This is where I draw my strength from. This is where I draw my substance from. From the Holy Spirit. From the Word of God. In my prayer closet. That's where I become strong. This is how I become what God has called me to be. And until you reach this, this fact, until you reach the end of yourself, you know, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. No, no, no. You have to reach the end of yourself and realize, I can't do it. And when you come to the end of yourself, that's when you become to the beginning of God. And then God says, you know what, let me put my power in you. And let me put my spirit in you. And let me allow you to become what I want you to be. There's a hymn. It puts it pretty, pretty good. It says, the hymn is called, Make Me Captive. It says this, third verse. My power is faint and low till I have learned to serve. It wants the needed fire to glow. It wants the breeze to nerve. I cannot drive the world until itself be driven. Its flag can only be unfurled when thou shalt breathe from heaven. Friends, all we have, we have to unfurl it. God puts his breath in us to empower us. To move along. Because what does the Bible exhort us? I'm going to test you guys. Be strong in ourselves and in our own strength. Right? No. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Friends, we need to come to the point of Adam. Remember Adam before he fell? It was a beautiful relationship. He was dependent upon Almighty God for everything. That's where we need to be. Dependent upon God for everything. Because when we fail, listen carefully, gentlemen, when we fail to stop, when we stop depending on God for everything, that's when we start to fall. Because remember Samson. We talked about it in the men's study months ago. What was Samson's problem? 
He had a lot of problems. What was his main problem? He failed to realize this. And you can read it today. It's repeated. He was just as weak as any other man. And that's where you have to be. You have to realize you're just as weak as any other man apart from the Spirit of God working in your life. And for men, when you do these things, when you want to do these things and desire a work of God in your life, you will be criticized heavily. Charles Spurgeon said this, Bold-hearted men will always be called mean-spirited by cowards. When a man leads, they, they want to do what Christ wants over what they want. When a mighty man leads, they want to lead in the same manner that Christ leads. This is what makes a biblical man's leadership so attractive. Friends, he's calling us to this stability and to this maturity. That's the steel, right? That's the steel. It's not, sometimes that's a little rough, though. Steel can be, steel's not so much fun to deal with, right? That's why he puts the velvet on. Number five, the velvet. A man will love God and others sacrificially. A man will love God and others sacrificially. Look at verse 14. Let all, that you be, let all that you do be done in love. There it is, friends. There's the velvet. Let all that you do be done in love. This here is the glue that holds everything together. Because if you were around a guy who was just all steel, like what we just described right there, that would not really be real fun, would it? I mean, it'd be a little abrasive, right? Steel. That's why Paul says, in all those things, let there be love. Let there be compassion. A man by the name of Carl Sandburg described Abraham Lincoln like this. He said, Abraham Lincoln was a man of steel and velvet. And that is what Paul the Apostle is calling us to today. To be tender, to be firm. And you know... I don't know if you're going to go out to eat today. Wherever your favorite place is to go out to eat, if you're a salad person, you know you get your salad dressing, right? And a lot of people say it like this. Can you put that on the side, right? No, no. Love isn't to be on the side. You want to pour that love over everything. It's to permeate everything in our lives, guys, from our vocation to our homes, to our churches, everything, everything. Changing diapers in love, yes. Making dinner in love, yes. Putting puzzles together in love, yes. I said it was not going to be easy. Everything we do is done in love. I like what John MacArthur said on this. John MacArthur said this, quote, Love complements and balances everything else. Love's, love keeps our firmness from becoming hardness and our strength from becoming domineering. Love keeps our maturity gentle and our sound doctrine from becoming obstinate dogmatism and our right living from becoming smug self-righteousness. In other words, guys, when we're courageous, we're loving. When we're firm, we're loving. When we're strong, we're loving. When we're on guard and watching, we're loving. In everything, we are to do it in love. That is what Corinth needed. That's what Corinth needed. They needed men to be both steel and velvet. And today, in our culture in America today, we need men who are steel and velvet, who accept the responsibility to lead, who seek God's approval and not man's approval, who reject passivity to follow God's word, and who lead and love courageously and love sacrificially. Friends, I pray that God works those things into our lives. Again, each day, Lord, make me more and more 
like you. And friend, I don't know where you're at today, but you can't live for Christ without Christ as an unbeliever. You can't live for Him apart from His Word and His Spirit. And you say, what, what makes me a believer in Jesus Christ? It's, it's not something that I do. It's something that God has done for me. And then what does He do? He works these things in me then. But ultimately it starts right there, what God has done for me. Because what did Christ do for me? He took all of my sin, all of our sin upon himself on a cross, dying for our sin in our place, rising again on the third day. And what happens when I receive that by faith, right? He changes me, not from the outside. He doesn't try to reform my person. He transforms me, listen carefully, from the inside out. It's not about me, oh, I got to be courageous. I got to, I got to, you know, do this and I got to lead. No, no, no. You allow him to work these things in you and out from your life, friends. If you have not received Christ, I pray today you would receive Christ and become the man of God that he wants you to be for his glory, for the joy of your spouse and for the blessing of of your children, and the strength of the church. Let us bow our heads in prayer. O oh, gracious God and loving Father, we thank you that we have your word to turn to in a day of confusion, in a day of instability, in a day of change. We ask that you would write your word in the life of our church, in our individual lives, in our homes, that you would replace our sleepiness, our dreaminess with, with being guarded and watchful. That, Lord, that you would take our weaknesses and you would replace them with your strength. That you would take our fear, Lord, and replace it with your courage. And that you would, place, would take our immaturity and replace it with your maturity. And what we're tempted, Lord, to to exalt ourselves and become proud and self-seeking, Lord, that we remember that our Lord Jesus was none of those things, that he was humble, compassionate, and loving, and that we would come back to the simplicity that is found at the foot of the cross. And, Lord, that our light would be that light of Jesus, a light which people desire to come to, a light which exudes love, peace, firmness, as well as gentleness. Father, I pray for each man today here, each father, each brother, each friend, each husband, Lord, that they would surrender to you everything they have, their will, their emotion, their worth, Lord, that they would say, Lord, it is all yours. Make me into the man that you want me to be. Fill me afresh, Lord, with your spirit that I can live for you each and every day to uphold my calling. And we pray these things in the magnificent name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And friends, as uh, musicians come forward, we're going to sing Surrender All. Very familiar hymn. If you need prayer today, if you want to, you know, say, hey, this maybe it's something I haven't surrendered to the Lord. You know, I'm a Christian. I, I, I've confessed Jesus Christ, but, you know, I just haven't surrendered everything to him, to, you know, today. Maybe today is the day, following Father's Day. Say, you know what? I'm all in today. I'm surrendering it all.